The Russian Civil War began in the aftermath of the Great October Revolution of 1917. While the revolution itself was almost bloodless, the civil war that followed was one of the most tragic periods in Russian history. Violence and cruelty became commonplace in the four years that followed, and hopes for democracy were crushed. Russia was ruled by a small group of revolutionaries known as the Bolsheviks, who understood only too well what they must do to hold the power they had seized. Those who opposed the Bolsheviks understood that these new leaders would irrevocably change Russia. The struggle between the Bolsheviks and their enemies shaped the new Soviet state and its later development. Millions were killed and crippled, while hundreds of thousands, the bloom of the nation, left the country never to return. The causes of the Russian Civil War were deeply rooted in Russian history. The First World War had caused desperate suffering among the Russian people, but other more long-standing problems were just as important. For centuries, Russian peasants had been tied to land they did not own and forced to work for others. In 1861, only two civilized nations, the United States and Russia, permitted one man to own another and force him to work against his will. But in that year, as the United States began its own civil war to decide the question of slavery, Tsar Alexander II abolished serfdom in the Russian Empire. Yet vestiges of the old system continued to plague the vast majority of the Russian population, whose prospects for land and education remained severely limited. For Nicholas II, who became Tsar in 1894, the desires of many of his subjects for radical changes in government were difficult to accept. His indecisiveness plagued Russia and contributed to the country's internal problems. Russia entered World War I in 1914. By 1916, devastating military defeats and internal problems aggravated by the war caused most Russians to believe that revolution was the only solution. In 1917, Russia experienced not one, but two revolutions. The first revolution took place in February. Born of frustration and disappointment, this revolution of cues demonstrated the lack of confidence of urban workers in their government's effectiveness. On March the 2nd, 1917, Nicholas II abdicated and soon after, he and his family were arrested. Soldiers and workers in Petrograd banded together to form a quasi-governmental organization called the Petrograd Soviet. Its leaders represented two political parties, the Social Revolutionaries and the Mensheviks. Under the Tsar, the Duma had been Russia's parliamentary body. Now the Duma's Provisional Committee nominated ministers for its first cabinet. Prince Lvov as cabinet head and Pavel Milyukov as Minister of Foreign Affairs. Revolutionary parties did not play a significant role in the February Revolution, but the Bolsheviks acted immediately to take advantage of the new freedom released by the revolution and amassed the forces necessary to launch an offensive. In April, the German government granted permission for Vladimir Ulyanov, a Russian exiled in Switzerland, to return to his homeland through German territory in a sealed train. This man would play the key role in Russia's revolutionary history. He was known as Ilyin, Tulin, Petrov, and Frey, but his most famous alias was Lenin. As the months passed, the provisional government lost popular support. Bolshevik propaganda hastened the erosion of police and military authority, and the government was unable to halt the disintegration of social order. Russia's people, convinced of the futility of the war, responded to anti-war propaganda. Combat action continued, but in the spring of 1917, fraternization between Russian and German soldiers began. Millions of peasants in uniform saw their fight as counterproductive. 
By summer, military command had collapsed and mass defection from the front lines began. These soldiers who voted with their feet were the largest group of combat-ready men Russia had ever absorbed from a war. In early June, the delegates to the first all-Russian Congress of Soviets in Petrograd heard Lenin state the Bolsheviks' intention to seize power. In July, the news of a military order issued under pressure from the Allies to launch a frontal offensive touched off a series of mass demonstrations. When the demonstrations became menacing, the government moved loyal troops into the city who brutally put down the unrest. The suppression of the demonstrations and the failure of the offensive brought down the head of the government, Prince Lvov, who was replaced by Alexander Kerensky. At the time, Kerensky, a socialist and a prominent lawyer, was a popular figure who, less than a year later, in flight from the Bolsheviks, would leave his country with a Serbian passport on the deck of a British cruiser, never to return. The commander-in-chief of the Russian army, Larv Kanilov, who participated in the conference, believed that only stronger measures would save his country. Late in August, he brought his wild division to Petrograd and attempted to establish a military dictatorship. His attempt failed. The division was disarmed and he was arrested. More and more people listened to Bolshevik calls for support. In Petrograd and other cities, Lenin and the Bolsheviks waged a determined propaganda campaign. The Bolsheviks set up a military revolutionary committee to plan and implement their seizure of power. Their military forces were loosely organized groups called Red Guards. The time had come. The capital of the Russian Empire was the city of St. Petersburg. During World War I, the city's name had been changed to Petrograd. After Nicholas II abdicated, the Winter Palace became the seat of the provisional government. During the week before the revolution, rumors of an attack circulated. The approaches to the Winter Palace were not guarded. Log barricades were hastily constructed, but provided almost no protection and the government troops assigned to protect the palace were young recruits and a battalion of women. The Bolsheviks, who had already captured the Smolny Institute, had more personnel and greater determination and confidence in their cause. The Bolshevik attack on the Winter Palace on October the 25th was not filmed, but in the week afterward, the damage from the attack was recorded. On October the 30th, the first military engagement of the Russian Civil War took place. The Bolsheviks' Red Guards faced Cossacks loyal to the recently overthrown government outside Petrograd. The Cossack general, Pyotr Krasnov, was arrested, but released almost immediately. Within a week, Soviet power was established almost bloodlessly throughout most of the former Russian Empire. But opposition remained, most importantly, in Moscow. Military cadets loyal to the provisional government seized the Kremlin, the State Duma, and other buildings in the city's center. The cadets made the Alexander and Alexis cadet schools their bases of operation. Red Guard units defeated their opponents, but lost a thousand troops in fighting that severely damaged Moscow's center. After General Kanilov's abortive attempt to assume power in Petrograd, he and other members of his staff were imprisoned in the town of Bukov. Because they believed they could justify their actions, none had attempted to escape. When Moscow fell, their lives were in danger. 
they were freed by the commander-in-chief of the Russian army and made their way south to the Don. The generals hoped to make common cause with Cossack Ataman Alexei Kaledin, who had seized power in the Don region and refused to recognize the Bolshevik government. Many of those loyal to the former government went south to the Don. There, the White Volunteer Army was formed from the remaining forces of the Russian army. The 4,000 men were united in their hatred of the Bolsheviks. General Mikhail Alexeyev became the first supreme commander of the Volunteer Army. He had been commander-in-chief of the Russian forces, but was now dying of cancer. When General Karnilov arrived in the south, he assumed military command, leaving civil and diplomatic matters to Alexeyev. The volunteer army badly needed arms and ammunition. Russia's military industry was concentrated in the country's center, now almost completely controlled by the Bolsheviks. So the whites turned for help to Russia's former allies who were still at war with Germany. The French, British and Americans to whom the whites appealed could not decide what groups to support and what aid to send. In December 1917, Bolshevik troops headed south to the Don, collecting scattered red units on the way. The march marked the beginning of the Echelon War, a period that lasted until mid-1918, when no front lines existed and fighting along the railroads went on with uprisings in urban areas. Red military forces were small and highly mobile. Cossacks had traditionally been considered the most loyal supporters of the empire. Grand Prince Alexei, the son of Nicholas II, had held the title of Ataman of the Cossacks since he was four years old. The highly trained and well-equipped Cossacks had formed the emperor's crack guards. The Don Cossacks were formidable opponents of the Bolsheviks. But many Cossacks were disillusioned by World War I, while non-Cossacks of the Don were leaning towards the Bolsheviks. Many people who lived in the Don opposed Kaledin's union with the commanders of the volunteer army and the politicians who had fled to the Don from Petrograd. These men, who wanted to revive Russia as an indivisible state, were unwelcome by the people of the Don, who wanted to create an independent state. On January the 10th, 1918, the Congress of Frontline Cossacks stripped Kaledin of his powers as Ataman, and Kaledin shot himself. General Kanilov decided to leave the Don and lead the volunteer army to the Kuban. Avoiding the more numerous Reds, Kanilov's forces joined the troops of the white Kuban government and reached Yekaterinodar, the capital of the Kuban. The volunteer army's trek across the snow-covered Kuban steppe became known as the Ice March. On April the 8th, Kanilov attempted to take the Kuban capital. The assault was beaten back and only 1,500 men were left in the volunteer army. Kornilov decided to attack again, but in the early morning hours of April the 13th, a shell hit the headquarters of the volunteer army, killing Kornilov himself. It was a blow to his men. General Danikin assumed command and decided to retreat from Yekaterinodar. Now only two factors saved the volunteer army from defeat. Mounting anti-Bolshevik sentiment in the Kuban Cossack villages and indecisive Red military forces. Instead of pursuing Denikin's forces, the Reds exhumed Karnilov's body and displayed it in the city. In May 1918, Denikin led his troops back to the Don. New Cossack volunteers increased the size of the army to three and a half thousand men. 
by late 1918, the volunteer army posed a serious threat to the Bolsheviks. In November 1917, Colonel Alexander Dutov, the Ataman of the Orenburg Cossacks, launched a campaign in the southern Urals. A red unit commanded by 27-year-old Vasily Blücher was sent to the southern Urals. Blücher's military strategy reinstated Bolshevik control in the region by January 1918 and Dutov retreated. Grigory Semyonov led a rebellion against the new Bolshevik government in the Baikal region. Semyonov's attempt to seize the region's main city failed and the Reds drove the Cossacks into Manchuria. The winter after the October Revolution inflicted greater suffering on all those who lived in Russia. Starvation first claimed the lives of the very young and the very old. Food supplies dwindled, lines grew longer and longer. Chaotic administration and a lack of fuel paralyzed the country's railroads so that the distribution of food was even more difficult. And despite their more desperate attempts, the Bolsheviks were unable to feed the population. At least half of the bread that did reach Russia's starving cities was brought by itinerant traders known as bagmen. And although the Bolsheviks identified these people as enemies of the state, they were forced to allow the private trade in bread both in the cities and the countryside. The Bolsheviks' most important concern was to fight against the growing opposition forces. At first, the Bolshevik military had included only Red Guard units made up of workers too few and poorly trained to wage war. In January 1918, the Bolshevik administration issued a decree forming the Workers and Peasants Red Army. The system was introduced to train new recruits 16 to 40 years old. A committee for military and naval affairs was formed. In March 1918, Lev Trotsky, formerly in charge of foreign affairs, was named the first Bolshevik Commissar for Military Affairs. Combat on the Russian-German front had stopped in the fall of 1917 and talks began on November the 22nd in the town of Brest-Litovsk. Ludendorff, the leader of the German delegation, and Trotsky, who headed the Bolshevik delegation, fiercely opposed making peace. The Bolshevik position was weakened by direct negotiations between the Central Rada the Ukraine central government and the Germans. The Rada, under pressure from a Bolshevik offensive launched against the Ukraine in December 1917, made important concessions to the Germans. On February the 9th, 1918, two weeks after the Red Guard had taken Kiev, a treaty between the Ukraine and Germany was signed. The Germans now had authority over the entire Ukraine, the Crimea, and the Donbass region. Kaiser Wilhelm II could now legally use the Ukraine as an economic base for continuing the war. Talks with the Bolsheviks broke down, and on February the 18th, the Germans launched an offensive on the entire line that stretched from the Black Sea to the Baltic. the Germans moved with lightning speed. They entered the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, and the infantry set out for Tallinn, one of the most important bases for Russia's Baltic fleet. But five Russian cruisers with 10-inch guns posed such a serious threat to the Germans that they were afraid to attack the city. On February the 25th, the Russian Navy withdrew to Finland and then to Kronstadt. Six battleships, five cruisers, and more than 200 smaller vessels were saved. Mm -hmm. 
Meanwhile, the rapid advance of the Germans forced the Bolsheviks to agree to a humiliating peace treaty. On March the 3rd, 1918, the document was signed by Georgi Chicherin, who had replaced Trotsky as head of the Bolshevik delegation. Their reluctance to negotiate with Germany cost the Bolsheviks dearly. The original line of demarcation was moved to reflect the new advances of the Central Powers. The Bolsheviks were forced to demobilize their forces, renounce their claims on Lithuania, Poland and Kurland, and recognize the independence of the Ukraine and Finland and German occupation of Russian territories. Two days before the Bolsheviks signed the treaty at Brest-Litovsk, the Germans entered Kiev. 29 infantry divisions and four cavalry divisions made up Germany's army of occupation in the Ukraine. Field Marshal Eichhorn was named Commander-in-Chief of the Occupation Forces. Red resistance had no effect on the German troops, who were slowed only by the distances across the Ukraine itself. Then in March, the Germans captured more than 80,000 prisoners and seized enormous quantities of weapons and ammunition. By April, the Germans had seized Odessa and advanced to the borders of the Don Cossack region. A puppet Ukrainian government was set up in Kiev under Getman Pavlo Skaropadsky. The government acted only on orders from the German military command. The economic union with Germany that the Ukrainians envisioned became instead a reign of fear and terror. Foodstuffs were requisitioned, terror became widespread and concentration camps were constructed throughout the Ukraine guerrilla movements began to form, unleashing violence often more dreadful than that of the Germans. In February, the German army in the north advanced as far as Narva. Although it was the last Bolshevik stronghold on the way to Petrograd, it was defended by poorly organized and equipped red units who yielded the city without any resistance. Pavel Dubienka, commander of Narva's Red Forces, was stripped of his position, expelled from the Bolshevik party and brought to trial. He fled with his lover, Alexandra Kalantai. Later, he was acquitted and fought with the Red Army. The German threat to Petrograd forced Lenin to relocate the Bolshevik government in Moscow, Russia's ancient capital in the heartland of the country. By mid-March, the Bolshevik leaders were settled in the Kremlin with their families. The German offensive brought about the fall of Soviet power on the Don. In May 1918, the Circle of Salvation of the Don elected General Krasnov as its ataman. He ordered the execution of the leaders of the Don Revolutionary Committee and traded foodstuffs for German armaments critical to the military action he planned in order to liberate the Don. Other events also threatened Bolshevik power. On March the 6th, 1918, the British cruiser Glory landed at the northern port of Murmansk. Troops followed to protect Allied ammunition stores in the city. The Murmansk City Council sanctioned Allied defense of the city and the Allies agreed to provide staples for the local population and not to interfere in regional affairs. Foreign troops entered Russia's Far East. On April the 5th, Japanese ships sailed into the port of Vladivostok. After three Japanese citizens were murdered by Russians, Japanese marines supported by British soldiers took the city. The Allied contingent in the Russian Far East soon exceeded 90,000 men, 8,000 of whom were Americans sent to support the Czech Legion. The Czech Legion rebelled against the Bolsheviks in late May 1918 across the Trans-Siberian Railway from the Volga River to the Pacific Ocean. Czech units were traveling east through Siberia to reach the battlefields of Western Europe. 
These forces were centered in the area between the Volga and the Ural Mountains, where Russia's defense industry had been relocated. A group of Czech nationals living in the Russian Empire received permission from the Tsar to form a military unit. By the end of 1917, the corps numbered 40,000 and were perceived as a threat to the Bolsheviks. When the treaty between Russia and Germany was signed, the Czech National Council declared the Czech Legion a unit of the French army. Czech nationalists, led by Tomasz Masaryk and Edward Benesch, hoped to use the Legion to fight for their country's independence. Masaryk reached an agreement with the Bolshevik government that allowed Czech troops in lands controlled by the Bolsheviks to travel to Vladivostok, where they were to board ships bound for France. Czech soldiers were to surrender their weapons, but their commanders feared the Bolsheviks would betray them. When the Czechs intercepted a cable from Trotsky with orders to kill any Czech found to be carrying a weapon, the Czechs attacked the Reds. Weak communist influence in the region helped the Czechs, who seized several cities on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. The Czech offensive revived anti-Bolshevik sentiments in the East. Despite the Reds' plight on the German front and the Don, more troops were needed to create an Eastern front. But before this front was operational, other events intervened. Because Germany occupied the Crimea, the Bolshevik government ordered the Black Sea Fleet moved. Germany demanded that the fleet return to the Crimea. The Bolshevik government sent a second coded message to sink the fleet. Naval personnel finally complied after the arrival of Lenin's envoy, Fyodor Raskolnikov. In late June, another British contingent of 2,000 men landed in Murmansk, and an Allied squadron of 147 vessels approached Arkhangelsk. Supported by local white forces, these troops took the city. The number of Allied forces in the north grew to more than 23,000. Their objective was to consolidate all regional forces that opposed the Bolsheviks. General Poole, the Allied commander, intended to drive his troops deep into Russia. Supported by 100,000 anti-Bolshevik Russians, the Allies were to link up with Czech forces. Poole's plan was unworkable, and the Allies made little progress on the Northern Front, but their presence dramatically complicated the Bolsheviks' relations with Germany and caused a rise in anti-Bolshevik activity within Russia. In Yaroslavl, right social revolutionaries under the leadership of Boris Savinkov rebelled on July the 3rd. Savinkov had been an infamous terrorist. Savinkov's forces were only defeated with barrages of heavy artillery. On July 22nd, the city lay in ruins. The red victory over Savinkov's forces coincided with the defeat of the left socialist revolutionary rebellion in Moscow. The left SR rebellion began in July during the 5th Congress of Soviets held in Moscow. A majority of the delegates had approved a policy of maintaining peace with Germany at any cost. The left SRs opposed making peace with Germany and attempted to force a break in the Brest-Litovsk Treaty by assassinating the German ambassador, Count Leopoldus Mürbach, on July the 5th. The next day, the left SRs, led by Maria Spiridonova, began an uprising in Moscow. They arrested Felix Zezinsky and 30 other Bolsheviks. The rebels seized the central telegraph office, but could not take the Kremlin. On July the 7th, after bitter street fighting, 
units of the Latvian riflemen stormed the left SR headquarters in Moscow. Over 300 people were taken prisoner, 13 were later shot. This rebellion in Moscow was the aftermath of a bitter power struggle between the Bolsheviks and their left social revolutionary and Menshevik opponents. The Bolsheviks became determined to destroy all opposition to their revolutionary program. In December 1917, an organization called the All-Russia Extraordinary Commission, headed by Dzerzhinsky, was formed to fight opposition to Bolshevik control. During the next decade, it became an instrument of political suppression and a system of terror. It is symbolic that the Bolsheviks put up a statue of Robespierre, who had said, the basis of a democratic government is virtue. The means for implementing it is terror. Dzerzhinsky's organization, the Chika, launched an attack against the old order, and all the people and institutions that sought to preserve it were marked for destruction. The victims of the Chika's terror were selected not so much on the basis of crimes perpetrated against the new government, but on the basis of the threat they represented to the new objectives. In the months after the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks' political opponents used terrorist tactics reminiscent of the last decades of Tsarist Russia. In June 1918, the Bolshevik Commissar for Press and Propaganda was murdered. Then, on August the 17th, the head of the Petrograd Cheka was killed by a social revolutionary assassin. The Bolsheviks unleashed a campaign of terror against their opponents. The Red Terror became more intense after Fanny Kaplan, a member of the Social Revolutionaries, attempted to assassinate Lenin as he addressed the workers at a Petrograd factory. Bolshevik vengeance became more organized and the power of the Cheka was unlimited. Red Terror provoked not only the white opposition, but foreign troops and guerrilla partisans who retaliated by unleashing a terror of their own. Violent death became commonplace. After his abdication and arrest, Nicholas II, his wife Alexandra, their son Alexei, and their four daughters had been sent to Ekaterinburg, where they had been kept under guard. In July, the Bolsheviks feared that approaching white troops might free the former Tsar. On the night of the 17th, Local Cheka men executed the royal family. By the summer of 1918, Red forces had yielded large territories and Bolshevik Russia was no larger than the ancient Muscovite state. In the east, enemies of the Bolsheviks seized the cities all the way to Kazan. Earlier, an anti-Bolshevik government known as Komuch had been formed in the city of Samara. Now, Komok troops and forces of the Czech Legion entered the city of Kazan, unopposed. The Serbian battalion that defended Kazan's Kremlin fortress had betrayed the Bolsheviks, and the Red Flotilla withdrew up the Volga without offering any resistance. During World War I, when the Germans threatened Petrograd, the gold reserves of the provisional government had been sent to Kazan. The whites seized the gold when they captured the city. The white presence in Kazan posed a far greater threat to the Bolsheviks than the loss of the gold reserves. From Kazan, there was a direct road to Moscow. And the Bolsheviks feared an attack on the capital. The Eastern Front was now critical and Lev Trotsky arrived near Kazan. Trotsky was second only to Lenin in the Bolshevik leadership. Like Lenin, he firmly believed in the rightness of communist dogma and he implanted this belief among the masses through his unequaled oratory. 
more than anyone else, Trotsky shaped and influenced the Red Army. An arch enemy of Stalin, Trotsky was doomed to disappear from official Soviet history. In the West, he would often be viewed as the antithesis of Stalin, and many would forget that Trotsky created many of the concepts that would become pillars of Stalin socialism. To the Kazan front, Trotsky brought not only ammunition, but military discipline. He ordered deserters executed, then regrouped the Red forces. He singled out the best soldiers and appointed new commanders. Joachim Vatsetis, the commander of the Latvian riflemen, was placed in command of the Eastern Front. He, as well as 75,000 other Red Army officers, had served in the Tsarist army. As the empire collapsed, the Germans advanced, and their own troops disintegrated, they saw their primary objective as defending Russia. Trotsky believed his young army needed the knowledge and experience of these specialists. He was also aware that victory would require higher morale among the troops and a reimposition of the discipline that the Bolsheviks themselves had undermined before the revolution. But although Trotsky gave command authority to these former Tsarist officers, he appointed a Bolshevik commissar to supervise each one. Because Red military losses were immense, Lenin and Trotsky launched an active campaign at the rear to recruit and train new units. Five million people would eventually be trained in paramilitary organizations for the new Red Army. Near Kazan, in a combined operation, the forces of the newly formed Red Army won its first major victory. On September the 10th, the 5th Red Army and the ships of the Volga flotilla, supported by mine carriers from the Baltic fleet, took the city of Kazan. Trotsky referred to this victory as the event that taught the Red Army to fight. Two days after the Red Army consolidated a bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Volga, Simbirsk fell, thus opening the way to Samara, the capital of the anti-Bolshevik Komuch government. The Komuch escaped to Ufa, several hundred kilometers to the east, but by November, the Red Army had reached the city. The capture of Samara, a city in the largest grain-producing region, temporarily eased the Reds' food shortages. But hunger in urban areas continued, as Russia's peasants refused to surrender their grain supplies to the Bolsheviks. In May 1918, a system of compulsory requisitioning was introduced. The Bolsheviks organized food units. By the end of 1919, 70,000 men formed a food requisitioning army. Their work was simple robbery, and they caused starvation and death. Resistance was mercilessly crushed. One of the men appointed to head the food requisitioning units was Josef Stalin, who was sent to the Volga region in June 1918. Within a month, he had become chairman of the Military Revolutionary Committee on the Southern Front. Stalin's first combat command was at the Battle of Tsaritsyn, but he was not the architect of the strategy that saved the city from Cossack troops. 
Later, the minor role he played in the Red victories of the Civil War would be greatly exaggerated. Krasnov's Cossack army hoped to secure their stronghold on the Don by driving the Reds from Tsaritsyn, the strategic center closest to the Don area. From September 1918 to January 1919, Krasnov's forces encircled Tsaritsyn three times, but failed to take the city. After the bloody and exhausting battle, Tsaritsyn became known as the Red Verdun. Tsaritsyn cost the Reds dearly. In the autumn of 1918, 60,000 Red soldiers perished defending the city. The high casualties largely resulted from the incompetence of Stalin and Varashilov, who overrode the command decisions of former Tsarist officers. Months later, at the 8th Congress of the Bolshevik Party in March 1919, Trotsky attacked Stalin, Varashilov, and their associates. Lenin supported Trotsky's charge that ignoring experienced commanders and using guerrilla tactics caused the enormous red losses at Tsaritsyn. A majority in the Congress agreed with Lenin that the Red Army could not exist without iron discipline. Stalin never forgot his defeat or forgave Trotsky. The Red Army began its transformation into a powerful and well-organized fighting force. In the summer and autumn of 1918, the Red Army had to face not only Krasnov's Cossacks, but also Denikin's volunteer army. Denikin had finally received Allied aid. With fresh stores of material and ammunition and troop reinforcements, Denikin launched an offensive to Yekaterinodar, the capital of the Kuban, which the volunteer army had failed to take the previous spring. Denikin captured key railway stations and cut off the Taman Red Army located to the west. These 30,000 soldiers managed to join the major force of the Red Army, but could not save it from defeat. On August the 16th, Denikin's forces entered the capital of the Kuban. Soon they had taken the second largest city in the Kuban. By late autumn, the bulk of the Red Force had been driven to the edge of the desert-like sandy steppe, which would become a mass grave. The Whites paid dearly for their victory. Thirty-year-old General Markov, one of Denikin's closest associates, died of wounds. He had commanded the 1st Officer Regiment and an infantry division, both of which bore his name after his death. 